I'm walking around the city to identify, explore, and break down the parts of skyscrapers that you might readily come across while walking on the sidewalk in places like Chicago. Well, you'll find stuff like the standpipe here all over the place, most folks probably pass right by without noticing. But down here on the street, skyscrapers have a lot to do, and it's a great place for us to look and understand the intentions of design and how things work. This area of a building at the opposite end that does all the skyscraping is filled with all the parts that connect to the ground below and the city beyond. Many of these connections can be seen or otherwise experienced from the sidewalk if you're paying attention. These connections are visible, physical, and direct, like columns that connect directly to caissons that go hundreds of feet down into the earth until they're embedded into solid bedrock, while other important connections remain invisible and are experienced a little less directly. For instance, this area has its own microclimate, made unique to anywhere else around just because of its proximity to this building. You might be stuck in perpetual shadow down here, caught inside the urban canyon. Or you might be caught up in the complex pattern of intense winds that find their genesis further up. Strong winds hitting a building at any height are forced up, down, and around until they find clear passage and encounter their next obstacle. For some of these winds, the ground is that obstacle, and when they converge at street level, they create wind tunnels that blast unsuspecting pedestrians. The specific design of the building can either exacerbate or alleviate this kind of thing. If it tapers toward the top, this allows winds to go around instead of shooting toward the ground. In addition, the facade itself might also do a lot of the work of mitigating those uncomfortable wind tunnel effects with things like louvers, screens, or other kinds of facade articulation that can disrupt and slow things down. All this crenellation isn't just aesthetic fancy. Even if you aren't looking up, in a poetic sense, walking along a building like this, you're able to feel the effects of the building's shape and its facade above you, even if those things are dozens of stories above the ground level. Different materials can also affect the environment depending on what kind of building you're next to. Especially if they're darker in color, the materials can absorb a lot of the heat during the day and then release it at night, making it a warm place to walk. You might also notice different materials of the sidewalk around certain skyscrapers, or the addition of a plaza if the building is set back from the street. This is usually coupled with a different treatment of the building's first level so that it becomes unique to all the other levels of the building. Architects pay special attention here because it's the only level that people can get right next to and even touch it. This is where the building literally touches down and the sidewalk material or the patterning of the plaza might carry a pattern or a motif that starts in the building and then flows down onto the ground surface. It's all about how the building manages to create a special connection to both the ground below and the city around. I'd say there's two primary ways that designs tend to land. First, a building might appear visually heavier near the street than it does above. This might include color changes like the building behind me, but also material changes with thicker or heavier materials than the materials above. The individual stones themselves or other elements like columns might beef up down here to give the building an appearance of having more solid looking and performing base condition. It's almost like the building is growing out of the earth or the building is like a pile of things and the most obvious arrangement is to put the heaviest pieces at the bottom. There's also a practice called rustication, which describes roughing up the stones so that they appear less finished and therefore closer to the state that they were in when they came from the Earth originally. Over here, next to the Tribune Tower along Michigan Avenue, the building is covered in little special elements, stones, and parts of buildings from around the world. This is called spolia and describes when buildings include foreign elements that come from other places. The term comes from the word spoils or the spoils of war, because this was done after society had been conquered and the pieces were displayed as proud reminders of the victory. Here it's a little less violent of a message, but it's still celebratory, and the history is there. That's all part of a more traditional approach, and modern buildings tend to go the other way with how they touch the ground. Almost out of defiance for how heavy everything actually is, these towers get lighter looking as they approach the sidewalk. Buildings like this might have only glass and slender columns down here, packaging all of the solid elements into the core, where the elevator and the stairs are located. These are required to be solid for code and structural reasons. The modern building appears less connected to the earth by creating a horizontal break in the vertical mass of the structure. But on the flip side, it promotes a more continuous and unbroken relationship to the horizontal direction and maintains a more porous connection with the city. Speaking of the horizontal, you might also not notice how the building deals with the uneven terrain of the city. Floors are almost always flat and perfectly horizontal, but the ground rarely is. So modern buildings like these will often have a plaza level that is a bit removed from the street, so the building has a clean area to spring from. This approach is called tabula rasa or blank slate. 
All this and the building is likely to have different collection of programs or activities that only occur on the ground level. Sometimes these activities are outward facing like the lobby or retail spaces, and other times are related to the internal workings of the building and can have windows for privacy reasons or for safety reasons. And this presents a really tough architectural problem because long expanses of Blake facade are not pleasant things to walk alongside for any stretch. So there might be details here which try to visually break up the facade. This might include murals, fake windows, or flattened columns called blasters. The fake windows might appear like they are filled in or use an opaque glass called spandro glass, which looks like a window, but doesn't actually allow a view. This building has a facade made of marble panels, but that's obviously not the material that's holding it up. That's either steel or concrete. But the way that the marble is attached and detailed tries to show you how thick it is with the overlapping corner detail that alternates directions. On some buildings like this, you'll be able to find hidden details for drainage that lets out water in case it gets behind some of these outer surface materials. Also along here are a series of metal connections. These are called standpipe connection valves, also known as fire department connections or FDCs. Once you notice them, you'll see them everywhere. They're strictly for use by the fire department in case of a fire, and they're an integral component of a larger fire suppression system that allows firefighters to augment the building's water supply during an emergency. When firefighters arrive at a fire in a high-rise building, they will connect the fire hoses from the fire trucks to these ground-level standpipe connections. This allows them to pump water into the standpipe system, which runs throughout the building. Red pipes will often have outlets on the interior as well, and a fold-up hose that can reach any space in the building. Some buildings have sprinkler systems connected to these standpipe systems, in which case these ground level connections can also be used to supply water for those sprinklers. If the building's own pumps can't provide enough pressure, or if they fail for any reason, the fire truck's pump can pressurize the water to ensure that it reaches the necessary height in the building. This is especially important in tall skyscrapers where a lot of pressure is needed to push the water up to the top floors. That's what's called a wet standpipe system, when it's always filled with water. But some buildings have what's called a dry or a semi-dry system that aren't always filled. And in that case, these ground level connections are the primary means of filling the standpipes with water in case of a fire. But here on the street, it's interesting to know which buildings try to hide these things versus which try and celebrate them. Some are hidden from view off to the side and marked with a utilitarian spout. But some buildings really make these ornate with polished chrome and other fancy materiality and detailing. The same range of attitudes can be found for almost all this stuff. These buildings are on Wacker Drive. If you know anything about the strange parts of Chicago, you'll know that this is only one level of the street. There's an entire lower Wacker that flows right underneath. This serves as another place for all the stuff to go that requires a direct connection to the city, but isn't the main stuff to look at. Down here, delivery or trash trucks can connect right to the building without ever disrupting anything on the street. From here, it's difficult to tell where a building begins or ends. Different heights or materials don't matter much, and every building gets consumed in the infrastructure of the city, losing its sense of identity and autonomy. Even though Chicago does have its extensive alley system, creating a front and back for most of the tall buildings here, this area offers another back door of sorts. While this place isn't somewhere you probably want to spend a ton of time, it's extremely useful to have these redundant connections, and they keep things cleaner on the street than would be possible otherwise. While you don't see Lower Wacker from here, you can feel its effects. Loading docks are usually pretty big, loud, and smelly. They have to accommodate huge trucks that have distinctly inhuman emissions and physical requirements. Loading docks are usually marked by a unique door that you won't find anywhere else, which can be difficult to integrate into the rest of the building. Overall, I find these kinds of areas of the building really fascinating because you can really tell just how hard the architect is or is not trying to integrate these elements that they'd likely rather not include. The loading dock door is also usually accompanied by all sorts of back doors that both the architect and the building security would probably prefer that you wouldn't pay too close attention to. They might also be flushed to the facade and made of a material that disguises its doorness with barely any seams. Sometimes these are one-way doors just for exiting and therefore wouldn't have a handle on the outside. These might connect on the other side to a fire stair or a hallway that connects to the fire stair. They should only be used by people moving out and away from the building in the event of a fire. Chicago doesn't have a ton of external fire escapes like New York does. This is mostly due to the Chicago fire sweeping away many of the residential buildings that would be rebuilt later with a more aggressive attitude toward fire prevention. While in New York, the older buildings may not provide adequate internal means of getting out in case of a fire. The decision then to have an external fire escape frees up internal area for more living space while cluttering up the outside. 
But either way, the external escape won't come all the way down to the ground level to prevent people from scaling up. Instead, that last bit will swing down when engaged from above. So as people travel down, they have an unbroken connection with the ground. Of course, down here you'll also find other invisible protective infrastructure. Cameras and bollards are usually designed to be indiscreet unless the tenant has an interest in overtly displaying these things to show off how fortified the building is. Protection is often hidden behind plantings or other elements that provide a dual function. The strategy is to avoid elements doing just one thing and looking bland. Instead, designers might try to incorporate elements that do a few different things and hopefully contribute positively to the overall streetscape. I think that's what well-designed skyscrapers do at street level. The way that tall buildings touch the ground requires intricate planning and thoughtful consideration. Factors such as how the building interacts with the pedestrian environment, uh, how it provides architectural continuity with the surrounding context, vehicular and pedestrian access, public spaces, and mitigating wind are all shaping the environment down here. The challenge for architects then and urban designers is to use these considerations as an opportunity to promote inclusive, sustainable, and dynamic urban spaces. By doing so, skyscrapers not only define city skylines, but also enrich the everyday life of city dwellers at street level. Man, walking around the city really left me drained. As soon as I got home, I brewed up a cup of what might just be my new favorite coffee, Sparrow's Coffee High Five Blend. I received it from my subscription from this video's sponsor, Trade Coffee. It's even roasted in my home state of Michigan, and it is delicious. Trade Coffee is a subscription that takes all of the guesswork out of finding coffee that you love. You head over to their website, answer a few questions about the kinds of stuff you like, how you like to make it. It's super easy, I promise. Then Trade Coffee works their magic by pairing you with personalized recommendations from over 55 of the nation's top rated independent roasters. They sort through over 450 different roasts to find the perfect ones just for you. Then they deliver them right to your door on your schedule, and all you have to do is enjoy. I've been a customer, I think, for a few months now, and I've loved every single bag. It's a great way to have something different every couple of weeks without having to think about it too much. And I find that I'm making coffee at home way more instead of wasting money at the expensive cafe around the corner where I'd just be getting the same thing every day anyway. That's another thing that's great. It's that they're connecting you with independent roasters who only source their beans sustainably. So you're still supporting local businesses and saving money at the same time. Every bag is roasted fresh on demand before it arrives to you ready to brew, which is good because I've walked around enough for today and I just want to enjoy my coffee. So join me in having Trade elevate your morning routine to new heights with better coffee. Right now, Trade is offering my viewers a free bag of coffee with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash Stuart Hicks. So click the link that's right here in the video or head to the link in the description, drinktrade.com slash Stuart Hicks for a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Enjoy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that like button. While you're here, leave a comment with your thoughts about the bases of skyscrapers. I love engaging in the dialogue. Then check out some of these other videos which come out every other Thursday. See you over there.